We didn't finish with the questions last time, so I wanted to finish with the questions uh, for the last set of slides, and then we'll continue with today's lecture. So these are the questions we had at the end. Uh, how does one keep track of indexical relationships using a symbolic system? Does anyone remember about this? So if you recall, we had, in, when, when, when the chimpanzees were learning how to do, or to understand these symbolic relationships, you recall they learned the indexical associations first, basically just learning through memory which pairs match some type of reward. But then at a certain point, some of the monkeys were able to figure out, oh, there's a, there's a pattern, there's a system here in which one particular sign links up to these other signs, and that the, the relationship between the signs is going to determine the way the objects relate to each other. And it's that reversal where this, the sign-to-sign the -sign relationships then become defining for the indexical relationships is the way in which you keep track of those indexical relationships within a symbolic system, right? And so that instead of memorizing every combination or possibility of a combination between signs, you, you understand the way in which the signs relate to each other and all of a sudden it becomes much easier uh, to, uh, to understand the indexical relationships, or to, and, to, and to, to remember what goes, which sign goes with which sign. So that's the first question, right? So you, you keep track of indexical relationships using a symbolic system by keeping track of the sign to sign relationships that are possible and impossible. And by doing that, then you understand the way the object relationships are matching up as well, right? Um, how does a grammatical structure create a category of names? Do you recall? Anybody want to try and answer that question? No? No? Well, okay, so let me remind you, a grammatical structure, like a verb, once you define a verb as, say, with the, with the chimpanzees, as a give me verb, that goes with a particular category of nouns, which are things to eat, right? By defining the verb, you've defined a whole category of nouns, and those nouns then fit with that verb, um, and in fact aren't just sort of random nouns, but always are nouns that uh, are understood from the beginning as linked up to another, uh, another sign, right? So that each new sign is learned not just as a separate independent item, but as uh, a sign that's set in relationship to other signs, right? And so that's the key, that, that the grammatical structure sets up the prerequisites for integrating new nouns. So new nouns are never integrated into a human language system as sort of random names or just unlinked to everything else, but always as something that is linked up to an existing structure. And then why does semantic meaning depend on syntactical relationship in human language? So that, that's just kind of an extension of what we just, I just talked about in terms of, uh, of the grammar and linking up to names. And what, what's at stake is, is the same issue of the meaning of words depends upon the relationships that they have with other words. Right? And so that relationship to other words is going to be defining for the meaning even though the, the relationship of the word to the object will also be important, but only as a consequence of the relationship to, those, to the other signs. Right? And so that's, that's what creates the particular system, a symbolic system of human language, and, and it makes actually it easier. That's what we've seen with the, with the chimpanzees. It makes it easier to remember the relationships between signs and objects, right? And, and how those relationships between objects to each other also then link up to relationships between signs, right? So that was just a kind of a short little summary from the, of the last part of the lecture. Any questions at this point? <laughs>
All right. So I just want to go into, now that we've gone through this first section about the way symbolic relationships function according to Deacon, I wanted to just summarize a little bit the way Deacon's ideas fit with the ideas of other thinkers that we, we've encountered in the class. One thing that is interesting here is that, in fact, Deacon is taking up Warburton's notion. Uh, you remember that um, language originates with figures, things like metaphors and metonymy and, and similes. He's, he does that by insisting that that symbolic structure is based on icons, on likenesses, in which the relationships between objects are like the relationships between signs, right? And so that, that likeness relationship is actually, a, it's, a, it's a metaphorical relationship. It's a kind of a, a figure of speech that becomes defining for the relationships between the signs and the object. And it's, and it's also a figure of speech in the sense that it, it requires this sort of mental kind of leap, right? The way he, the way he um, describes th what the chimpanzees have to do in order to understand the symbolic system. It's not about yet memorizing yet another piece of information. It's about seeing what they've already memorized in a new, from a new perspective that sees the relationship, that sees a kind of metaphorical relationship between those sign relationships and the object relationship. So, so, so Deacon really is actually taking up this idea of metaphor as the basis of language, right, that we saw from, that, that we saw from Warburton. He's also taking up the idea for, uh, from Hader that there's this qualitative distinction between animal communication and human communication that also extends into the way in which, you know, animals uh, relate to their environment and in a, in a different way than humans relate to their environment. And so that emphasis on a kind of qualitative distinction, a kind of, uh, you know, um, leap from animal to human communication is something that Deacon is also um, taking up from, from Hader. He's also very clearly taking over this distinction between Index, indices and, and, and symbols from Peirce, right? So that whole discussion that we had in Peirce about likeness, index, and symbol is something that, uh, that, uh, that Deacon is explicitly citing, and he's really using it in a way that matches up with these, these previous distinctions in, in a way that links up with, with Warburton and, Her and, and Hatter, right? So that he's, he's linking up this distinction between index and symbol with that um, that kind of leap that he's talking about, that, that we talked about with Hatter. And it's also, and, and the way he's interpreting the symbol is also one that, that takes up this issue of metaphor, right? So, so there's, there's lots of connections that Peirce is making to these, these previous uh, theories about language. But it's also clear that Deacon is setting himself against uh, Steven Pinker's idea about how uh, language functions in the brain. The key point, I think, here up to this point that we've been discussing is that Pinker sees thought as something separate from language in the brain, so that there's, there's, there are these, there's this mentalese, this sort of thought language that goes, and then, there's, and then there's human language, and those are sort of two separate processes. Deacon, on the other hand, and he's here, he's, he's kind of agreeing with Hatter and Peirce, I would say, in arguing that thought and language participate in the same sign process, that you can't separate those two processes, that th there's, a, there's a single kind of symbolic process of symbolic relationships and, um, and symbolic understanding of signs that thought participates in, but also language participates in. And uh, what's, what's most important is the ways in which signs relate to each other and, setting, and set up these relationships to objects within the symbolic context and um, it's, it's really the, not only the characteristic, the main characteristics of human language, but it also then becomes for Deacon and for Hader than the main characteristics of human thought, right? So um, those are the ways that I think that, that Deacon is relating to, to, to the other thinkers that we've discussed so far. We, we'll, I'll talk about Rousseau later on when we get um, to his, his, uh, his theory of the, uh, of the origin of language on Friday. So at this point then, uh, what, what I want to do is go through chapter four
and think through the way in which Deacon is understanding the relationship between language and the brain. And the first step here is that he sees that language is structured in a way that allows the human brain to learn it. And this is, um, you know, he's, he's taking the same evidence that Pinker had, which is the universal grammar and the way children are able to pick up that universal grammar, but he's, he's reinterpreting it. He he's, has a different interpretation of how it is that universal grammar um, is something that's picked up so easily by children. And, he, and his, he has this analogy. He says, well, you know, it might not be, you know, it, it's not necessarily true that, that children have to have this sort of, these pre-programmed circuits for, for the universal grammar. Instead, it might be that language has adjusted itself to sort of fit the way the, the human brain works, and specifically the way children's brains work. Uh, and his, his analogy is uh, this thing for, I don't know if, you might not be old enough to, to remember these old computer systems, right, where they, uh, uh, you know, it used to be that, you know, when you wanted to do something with a computer, you had to type in these, these weird commands, you know, and there, it was always like, you know, if you didn't type in the right command, it, it, would, it would screw up, and it, it, was, it was always a big, it was difficult using a computer. And he talked about when, when Apple first introduced its Macintosh computers, and they started with this sort of this this um, well, they could this object-oriented sort of interfaces where you could you know you had the files there's these pictures and you could use the pictures to move around things to put things in files and things like that. That was much more intuitive for people to use, and so this didn't mean that somehow people were, became more intelligent. It was just that that the 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 software manufacturers were designing their software to match people's intuitive guesses about what might work in order to, to, for them to be able to do what they wanted to do with their computer. And so Deacon is saying, well, this is maybe the way language developed in the sense that it's not that we had, we had developed a brain that could do the, the types of things that universal grammar does, but rather it might have been that language was changing or developed in a way that fit a child's guesses about what language should be doing, right? And by fitting guesses, it, um, it automatically develops the structures of universal grammar. So that these, what he's saying that these, you know, he's, he's, he's arguing that these intuitive guesses that children have tend to be right and that that's not an accident, right? And that, it, that it's actually something that's developing in a sense, not by design, but through a kind of environmental pressure um, that determines um, how language survives in the child's brain. So in this way, he's actually developing a theory of the evolution of language and indicating that language actually functions or develops according to rules of natural selection. So let me just remind you of, of what, what, what the prerequisites are for natural selection. This is a slide from a previous lecture in which we indicated that you can only have natural selection if you have these three, you know, criteria fulfilled. What first one is that there have to be variations, um, small variations in a, in a trait in a certain population. These variations have to be inheritable. And finally, these variations have to lead to corresponding variations in, um, uh, in the survival rates of, of the individuals that you know, that have a particular variation over another, right? And so what Deacon then argues is that language fulfills all of these requirements for natural selection, even though language is not like a, 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 a typical biological organism, right? So, you know, the first point he makes is that language does include lots of variation. In, in fact, what, he's, what he argues is that every single individual that uses language uses in a way that varies from the language of everybody else. Uh, even, you know, pe you know, several, if you take several people that speak English, they will all, each person will use English in a slightly different way. They'll, they'll have their own little quirks about how they use the language, even though they're, you know, speaking the same language, and they're in that sp same language group, though everybody's going to have a little bit of a variation. And he says that those variations are significant, um, that, that those variations are things that, 
could actually change the character of language and that they're not just kind of surface phenomena. They're, they're not just sort of like um, the you know, unimportant details about the way language functions, that those variations, in fact, are actually have co can have consequences uh, uh, for the structure of language. So in addition then, he says that the changes in language structure that you would get through these variations are, in fact, passed on from generation to generation, right? Um, he has this nice little diagram where he, uh, where he describes, you know, the, the child learning language. And one of the issues here is that the child hearing a kind of complex sentence will reduce it to this sort of more simplified sentence according to the, the phrase structure. So the phrase structure has lots of little, you know, branches in, in, the, in the tree, right? But the child will kind of ignore lots of the details and just see kind of the, uh, the main branches. And that's what's important to the child. And whatever the child kind of retains is what's going to get passed on to the next generation because the adult is, you know, at some point is going to die and then all that's left is the child. And the child's going to be the one who's going to be passing on the language, and not the adult eventually, right? So every time this happens, essentially, it, there's a, there's a passing on of small variations in language use from, from one generation to the next, and, and the conduit is really um, what, what children pick up and retain in terms of the, of, of the language that they're learning, right? So whatever the, whatever the children aren't learning or aren't picking up or sort of maybe find difficult to learn and never really, never really understand and, and don't use very well, that's obviously not going to survive into the next generation, right? So, um, so what he's indicating here is that um, the, this language learning success then becomes the, the kind of selection criteria for survivability of certain language structures from one generation to the next. So that there is, there's variation, there's a kind of indication of what counts as the criteria for creating survival of a particular language trait, you know, like a language structure or maybe a particular set of uh, vocabulary as well. And that those, that those particular traits that survive are also traits that are inherited into the next generation. And that what's going on is that it's not the brains that are changing, but it's the language that, are that is changing, right? And that, and that the, the, the language learning goes on through adjustments of, of language in child's brains rather than adjustments in the brains of children, right? And so um, this is the way he's kind of turning around the discussion that, that Pinker had about the ways in which um, universal grammar uh, is going to be uh, established, right? So, so ultimately then, he's seeing language as evolving in the same way as a biological organism does, right, in a process of natural selection. Right? And so his, his, his claim there is really that language is like a biological organism that has to be reproduced from one generation to the next, and that there are these variations in language that are, that are then passed on to, to future generations. And so, you know, when he, you know, he's looking at, you know, he doesn't, um, you know, the, the kind of evidence he's pointing to here is really just our experience of how language changes over time. So, you know, obviously English is not the same English as it was like, you know, 100 years ago or 200 years ago, it's been changing, or even, you know, even, even 10 years ago. And that change over time is the result of this sort of passing on of language structures from, uh, from each generation to the, to the next. And the, these little, little changes in, little variations in the way people use language are in fact not just a kind of surface phenomenon. It's not just a kind of the unimportant detail, even, in relationship to kind of the core universal grammar, right? Because you, you recall Pinker had so, said that there's this core universal grammar that's the same with all languages, and then there's all these details that vary between different languages, and that those details, in fact, are not so significant because what's really important is the universal grammar. What Deakin is saying, no, every change really is important. All of these variations, in fact, could have fundamental consequences for the way language functions in the future. And that's why we have to pay attention to them. And that's the process by which language adjusts to the human brain. Right? 